we're going to look at the second half of the second chapter of Romans. Paul has been attempting to identify for them, as what we've looked at today, that even though you may be a moral person, that that doesn't necessarily mean that just because you can point at other people and say you're better than them, that uh, you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we discussed that this morning. This morning, what we, what we looked at in Scripture was a little bit ambiguous, though. You couldn't really tell. There are people out there who, are, who do not have a relationship with Christ or who may be in other types or, or forms of religion that would say, I'm a very moral person. And because of that, God is going to be accepting of me. The Jews and those who would call themselves Christians would fall into that bigger lump category. Tonight, Paul is going to name names. Starting in verse 17, we see that he talks directly to the Jews. And he describes three things about them that I think we can apply to our own life as well as to, as to why certain things don't necessarily mean that we are saved. And the Jews relied on three different things. We, I think we Christians do the same thing. We rely on three different things to assume that we are saved. Now, I think you can look at what we have been going through in Romans, and you can see why Paul, in his ministry, angered the Jews. Because Paul was very confronting. And the arguments that Paul makes are those that, that form a death blow for a lot of these, these soft answers that people use to try to convince themselves that they are saved. Paul is going to demonstrate that the law, the law increases your privilege, but it also increases your accountability, that more is expected of you. Paul was constantly pushing that envelope with the Jews. It was Paul in Acts chapter 15 that went to the Jerusalem council and argued for the fact that you do not have to become a Jew first before you can become a Christian that you could actually not be circumcised was his argument. He didn't have to go through all those formalities. All you had to do was have faith in Jesus Christ and faith alone. And now Paul is coming along and making a statement that all people stand guilty. Jews, Gentiles, anybody who does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ stands guilty. And if you can imagine having some valuable family heirlooms and you've treasured these for all your, all your life. And finally, after the, the loss of your parents, you have somebody come in who has an expertise in jewelry. And they come and they look at them and they say they're very beautiful. But the problem is they're costume jewelry. And that's what Paul is going to tell many of people who hold on to these assumptions about their relationship with God tonight. You've held on to something you thought was valuable, but he's going to argue to them that this is the reason why you may not necessarily have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, do not get discouraged. You, if you haven't been through Romans before, you may be thinking that Romans is, is just an entire book of telling you what's wrong with you. But we are working our way to chapter 5. And in chapter 5, we're going to find out there that Paul is going to say that while we were yet enemies, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But he's got to convince us between now and then that we are lost, that we are enemies, that without Christ that we have no hope. And then he's going to just explode this wonderful hope to us starting in chapter 5 and it's really going to culminate in chapter 8 with some beautiful things. Wonderful things. Chapter 6 is, is absolutely wonderful as far as the doctrinal depth that it brings about what it means to be a Christian and to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But Paul has to get us through this period of, of understanding foundationally that everybody outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ is lost. I'd like to read verse 12, 13, 14, and 15 just to pick up where we left off today. And, and then starting in 17, I want to give you three, three things that you can falsely trust in that don't necessarily mean that you are a child of God. In verse 12 it says, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, 
these not having the law are a law unto themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11 says that God has set eternity in their hearts. God has in His creative work in the life of every human being set within them a sense of His reality. You can bring all these arguments and false assumptions in and you can actually bring a person to where we see a lot of people today uh, at least calling themselves atheists. But God in the raw material of every person puts within them, He sets within their hearts eternity. And Paul is, is talking about those who are without the law and those who are with the law. All of them are going to be judged. They'll be judged differently. If someone is given the light of the law and understanding God's revelation, they'll be judged in accordance to having that revelation available to them. But if somebody does not have that revelation available to them, and many people across this world today still do not have the Bible, if it's not in their language, they have not been confronted with the gospel or the, or the, the Bible itself for whatever reason, they will be judged in accordance to not having that particular knowledge available to them. But Romans chapter 1 says they will be found guilty without a relationship with Christ or without responding to the light that they have been given. The light of conscience and the light of natural revelation through creation. They'll, res they'll be responsible to both of those things. Now, Paul is saying in verse 13, it's not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law. That word for hearers has the idea of people who, are, who have their business of hearing. That that is what they do. The Jews always came into the synagogue and they would sit down and they would always hear the law read. They would always hear some interpretation or application of it. Just like many people do in churches today. It is a, a lot of people's business to go to this conference, to go to this church service. It is their business to hear. But not those who just hear are the ones who are showing a saving faith in their life. It is those who are doers who are actually evidencing that they are justified before God. There was a man who came to C.T. Studd, and this man had been trying to memorize and memorize the Sermon on the Mount, but he was unsuccessful in doing it. He came to C.T. Studd finally after a, a distance. He had been away, and he had come back from that distance uh, like a year had passed by, and he told C.T. Studd that he had memorized the entire Sermon on the Mount. And C.T. Studd said, well, make sure that it's not just words to you. Make sure you make application in your life. He said, that's exactly what I had to do to learn it. I found that when I tried to memorize it, it just didn't stick. So what I did was I would take this piece of it, I'd memorize that part of the Sermon on the Mount, then I'd go out and apply it somewhere. And when I did that, the memory began to, to stick in my life and in my mind. And I was able to memorize the entire Sermon on the Mount by putting it in to practice. It's not the hearers, but the doers who will be justified before God. And look at verse 14. For when the Gentiles do not have a law, for when Gentiles who do not have a law do instinctively or by their nature the things of the law, these not having the law are law unto themselves. God has put into every culture a sense, a sense of, of sin, a fear of judgment, and some attempt to atone for what they realize about their life maligned in many ways it is. But God has put that, that rough assemblance in every culture. It's not living up to anywhere near the light of Christ, but there is a sense of that there, a foundational sense upon which the gospel can be built. The Gentiles instinctively do the things of the law. When I was a kid, I watched this thing on National Geographic, or it was uh, maybe it was public television, but it showed this tribe in Africa and whenever they had a problem with stealing, they would line up all the men of the village. And then they would ask each man if they had done the stealing, and they would answer either yes or no. And after they gave the answer, if it was no, they would have them open their mouth, and they would take a hot knife and lay it across the tongue. And if that person 
was lying, when you lie and when you're holding something back, your, your saliva glands kind of retreat. If you're telling the truth, your saliva is healthy, it's active, and so whenever you put the knife on the tongue, it hits the saliva. But if you're lying, if you're guilty, it will hit the tongue directly because you'll have a dry mouth, and it will burn into the tongue. And that was their way of determining who the liar was. They knew in their culture, which is very primitive, that lying was wrong. They instinctively know that killing is wrong. They instinctively know other things are wrong that we find in Scripture because God has put it, He set eternity in the hearts of people. A moral compass is there about what is right and what is wrong. It says they show the work of the law written in their hearts and their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. I came across a testimony of a man named Marway. This man named Augustus Marway lived in a village, a very primitive village. He didn't put a stitch of clothes on until he was 14 years of age. He lived in a village that was constantly involved in tribal wars. And he resented, he said he resented as a young man, strangers coming to their house. Whenever they would come, he would race to eat the food before they could. He, he made such a pig of himself that his mom made him sit over in the corner of their hut while the, while the guests ate first. And he'd sit over there in the corner of the, hall and he, of the hut and just glare at them just staring at him until they noticed him and invited him to the table. So the mom decided she was going to put him outside. Whenever strangers came, he was not welcome in the house. He said he was incorrigible, that the whole village would ask this question, what is the matter with the son of Maui? He said he loved his mom, mom dearly, but he found himself doing terrible things. At one time, he picked up a stick, and he threw it at her legs, he missed her legs, and he hit a young child. And the child was, was, was horribly injured by it. The village meted out punishment for him for that act. What they did was they took him and they held him down by his arms and his legs, and they poured hot pepper soup down his nostrils. Now that's one, that's a new one. We can try that maybe and see if that works as well. If we can, Campbell's will make maybe a soup that will be a disciplinary soup. But that's what they did. They held him down. He said that I almost choked, and that for hours afterwards, my nose burned. He said he would go off into the forest, and he would pound his head against a tree, saying, what is wrong with me? I should kill myself. He said he hated being the white sheep of the family. One day, about, at about uh, a boy of about 12 returned from the coast, and this boy had seen the ocean. He had seen a town along the coast that actually had a, a, a large population. And when he came back, he came back, and none of these other kids had seen the ocean. They had not seen this town. And they sat and just listened to him describe what he had seen. One of the things that he said that caught Malway's attention was that he had seen that there was this house that people would meet together on Sundays. And he was so curious that he asked one of the people who was, who was leaving that house, why do you meet there every Sunday for that, that time that you're there? And their response was, we meet there to pray to the God, to the God who created everything, who created every, heaven and earth. And he said this, this God heard our prayers. Maui, in hearing that, said he had never heard of such a thing. It excited him, and he wanted to pray himself. He asked this boy to meet with him on Sundays, but this boy didn't want to do it. So he went by himself outside the village to a hut that his cousin was building, and he went in that hut, and he started to pray. He had never prayed in his life. He didn't know how to pray. But he decided that he would just talk to this God as if he was talking to a father. And he got excited when he did that. He did that for two years. He would go out to that hut every Sunday, and he would spend time talking to this God as if it was his father. After two years, the government began to build this road through their vicinity for this new invention that he had never heard of called an automobile. And for two weeks a month, they were, his tribe was sent out there to work for two years on this particular project. After that, he was allowed to go to visit his cousin in Sador. So he went there, and he found out after he got there that there was actually a house there where people met on Sundays to pray in Sador. He could not wait 
for Sunday. He describes being on a mat, waiting through that Saturday night, could not go to sleep, laying on that mat, just waiting. He'd heard a bell will ring when it's time to go, and he was just waiting to hear that bell. He showed up, and he sat at the back, and he listened to a man tell about God for the first time in his life. And he said it was more wonderful, wonderful than he had ever imagined. This man said that God loved him, sent his son named Jesus to take away his sins. And he thought, did this God know how terrible I was? Does he know the things about me that the people back in my village know? But he said instinctively he knew it was all true. God had prepared his heart. He had lived up to the light God had given him along the way, and God had increased the light with every step that he had taken. He gave his heart to, to God that morning, and this man, Mawe, became in our, in our generation the most significant man in Liberia for building churches and establishing churches and, and evangelizing uh, there in that particular country. But he lived up to the light. God gave him the semblance of a light of conscience and a fallen nature. He responded to that. And God began to build that light into his life, eventually bringing him to a point of confronting him with the gospel. So Paul is making a point. Without the law, with the law, you will be judged. God has given to the Gentiles an understanding of which can be built off of to give them the light of the gospel and the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, three things that can be false hopes for you. Number one, a label. The Jews were depending on a label. Number two, depending on a certain a semblance of facts or knowledge. And number three, depending on a certain act or work or sign. These are three things Paul is going to say will not work apart from a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. In verse, seven, verse 17 he says, But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God, Know His will and approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law. All these things were true about these people. They bore the name Jew. You may bear the name Christian. Is that enough? You may even bear the name Baptist. You think that would be enough? They thought just being a Jew automatically got you into heaven. You worked from there up. They believed, the rabbis taught that Abraham sits by the gates of hell. And he does not let any wicked Jew in. Not to speak of the righteous, he doesn't let any Jew step into the, to the gates of hell. That is what they believe. And Paul says, just because you bear the name Jew. Now they were called Hebrew. Some of them were called Hebrews because of the language they spoke. Not all Jews spoke Hebrew. Paul could speak Hebrew. But some of them were called Hebrews at times because that was their dominant language. Others were called Israelites, connecting them to the land. But the biggest category of all was Jew. We even see people today who call themselves Jews. They haven't been in a synagogue probably since they were 12 years old and got their bar mitzvah. They have no connection to God at all. Some of them probably call themselves atheists, but they are Jews. It's a heritage thing to many of them. But Paul said many people call themselves a Jew, and because of that they rely upon the law. That word for lie, rely means they, it's the same idea of, of resting against a wall, just casually doing it, mechanically, without any thought to it at all. They're assuming that their relationship and possession of the law means that they will be saved. God gave it to them, so that must mean that they have a relationship with God that will be saving to them. Also, they boast in God. They're prideful. They're prideful. They say, we have the God who created the heavens and earth, Gentiles, they, they taught that the Gentiles were fodders for fires of hell. They didn't even care about them. They boasted that they had the true God. They boasted in that knowledge. They boasted they had the law. They boasted in their name. It says, you know His will. You approve the things that are essential. You're even instructed out of the law, trained out of the law. There are people who have grown up calling themselves every day of their known life a Christian. And Paul is saying that is not enough. I have met numbers of people who could say that about themselves. I could say that about myself. That all along I made the assumption because if anybody would ask me as a teenager, are you a Christian? I said, absolutely. 
I used to be a member of this church, of this church, of this church. Certainly I'm a Christian. Paul's saying that's not enough. Just because you can grab onto that label, that's the label you're accustomed to, does not mean at all that you are saved. Now the second thing you find is you're not saved because of a certain knowledge that you have. Starting in verse 19, it says, And you are confident that you, are, you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth. My brother, my mom said, she, she used to teach the, the, uh, the teenage class at our church at Manford, Oklahoma. She said, my brother could answer every question, every Bible question that you can imagine. He would always be the one that would find the, first, the answer first or give the answer first. My brother today could not be farther away from God. But there was a time in his life when he had all the answers. I used to ask him questions. You know, what about this? What about this? As God was working in my heart, he was the one I went to. But when he got older, he got out of the house, he turned his back completely on God. But he had all this knowledge. It would amaze you how much knowledge the Pharisees had. And yet that knowledge never led them. Jesus said, you search the scriptures. You should be finding me there because it speaks of me. They had all this knowledge, but they had this pride, all these blinders on that kept them from ever finding the genuine truth. Just because you have a lot of knowledge of the Bible does not mean that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. There are people who are PhDs in all different fields of knowledge across this world. They have invested a lot of time in learning facts and figures and ideas and concepts. You can do that with the Bible. There are people who teach the Bible in, in seminaries and in universities. So I dare to say there's no way that they are saved. I took a, a course in religion at Oklahoma State University, and that guy could not be saved. And yet he had a lot of information. He had done a lot of studying, had a, had a lot of knowledge. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you are saved. Look at the sarcasm. Paul is saying, look, this is the, the arrogance that they had. You're confident that you yourself are a guide. This is how they saw everybody else, the blind. You're a light to those. Everybody else in their mind was in darkness. You're a corrector. Everybody else to them was foolish. You're a teacher. Everybody else to them was immature. When Lynn was, was pretty new in Christ, she went to get a haircut one day. And I had just told her a, a joke. And this joke was a joke about Oral Roberts. And it was a joke about when they were building the... The prayer tower, it wasn't a prayer tower, it was a, uh, it was a large hospital. In front of it, they had these praying hands. A lot of money went into building that. And the joke was, you know, how do, you, how do they raise money? Or how, how, how would they get the, uh, the hands to stay together because they had a problem with the hand? They put them up there and the one hand would come down. And they, they constantly could not keep it up. So there was one guy on the construction side who, who was, became aware of the problem. They said, we just cannot keep the one hand. These hands are as tall as this uh, building is. This one hand up, it keeps falling down. He says, I don't know how to keep it up. He reached into his back pocket and threw a 20 in, and the hand went up and held the 20. So she told that joke. She thought it was funny. And she, she told that joke to the lady who was cutting her hair, who happened to be a strong, charismatic. And this lady began to tell her that Baptists found out she was part of a Baptist church and marrying a Baptist minister. That Baptist, that's kindergarten Christianity. They are those who are immature. Whenever you start to speak in tongues, you will start to grow in your faith. And the Jews, they looked at everybody else, and they were so arrogant. They said, everybody else is immature. They're foolish. They're blind. They're in darkness. They have nothing to offer. We have the embodiment here in ourselves of the knowledge of God. We study it. We learn it. And Paul is saying knowledge does not necessarily mean that you are saved. And then he begins to apply. He, he, he takes a page out of the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, You therefore who teach another, do you teach yourself? The first pupil you ought to teach is yourself. 
You priest that one should not steal. Do you steal? Do you practice what you preach? You who say that one should not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You who abhor, abhor idols. Do you rob temples? He starts to make all these applications that begin to connect with guilt with them. These are things that Jesus talked about. He talked about, about those who commit adultery. Do you? Jesus said you commit adultery whenever it happens inside, not necessarily happening on the outside. It's a matter of the heart. He talked about, do you uh, preach that one should not steal? But do you steal yourself? Do you preach that that's... You know, preach that someone should not murder. Jesus said, whenever you say raka, whenever you say that somebody's life is not worth living, that's the same as mentally killing them and saying they're of no value. You might as well just physically do it as well. Jesus made a deeper ap application, presented a brand new realm of sin that they couldn't stand up against. The interesting one here is, do you abhor idols? And that word for abhor is... Do you, when you turn, when you see them, when you think about them, do you turn away from a stench? Do they so offend you? The thought of idolatry, does it so offend you? Then he says, do you rob temples? How do you rob temples? Malachi says, you rob temples, you rob God when you withhold tithes and offerings. He made an application that meant where they were. Because idolatry, you're idolatrous towards your money and things you want to buy with that money rather than give that to God who is justly doing. If you had somebody who was going to split split ten dollars with you, and you said, "Well, I'll take nine, and you take one," no, I'm going to take your one also. If that's the same attitude that many people show to God, and He identifies that these are the same problems that they are experiencing themselves. You who boast in the law through your breaking the law, you dishonor God. They bragged about their relationship with God, but when they lived in disobedience, they made an abomination. They, they uh, blasphemed God by their behavior, regardless of what they were saying with their words. And then he says, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. Their offensive sin after they had made such a big production of being connected to God, made God look ridiculous to the Gentiles. You know, one of the biggest problems I have of winning my brother to a relationship with Christ is, is televangelists. He turns on TV shows that have so-called Christian ministries on them and in his mind, that is the most ridiculous thing that he has ever seen. And he never, no way, wants any part of that. You can't get him to step foot into a normal church atmosphere to see that that is not the status quo of churches. But the behavior that is obviously filled up with greed and activities that are not godly, and people look at that and they blaspheme and ridicule God himself. I heard about a a game, a monopoly-like game called the Pearly Gates that's being made by Pearly Gate Enterprises in Yakima, Washington. The idea is to become an evangelist, to make it to the promised land without bankrupting your ministry. The pitfalls include a tower of prayer and fasting and no-tell motel. Characters are Jim and Tammy Faker, Jessica Kahn, Oral Roberts, and Jimmy swindler. Where they get this idea? By real life events of people who call themselves Christians. Who for all practical purpose display to the world that we are it in what it means to be a Christian. Just because you have a certain knowledge doesn't mean that with that knowledge you aren't dishonoring God. By your behavior and the very fact that you say, I know God, I have a relationship with God, I know all this about God, and then you act this way. You know, David, when David fell, it said that he had given the enemies of God reason to glory. Because he was so tightly connected with God, and then did, did what happened. 
It gave those who wanted to ridicule God an excuse to do that. Let me give you a last thing. Number one, you can't be saved by a label. Just because you have a label doesn't mean you're saved. Just because you have a certain knowledge of facts and things doesn't mean you're saved. And number three, just because you have a certain act in your life, a certain work that you've done, doesn't necessarily mean that you are saved. In verse 25 it says, For indeed circumcision is of value if you practice the law. But if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, a Gentile, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Cornelius would probably fit in that category. And he who is physically <clears throat> uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you? Oh, that was a terrible statement. A Gentile judge a Jew, who uncircumcised judge a circumcised? Will he not judge you who through having the letter of the law and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? Circumcision would not keep him from being saved. Circumcision was required by Jewish law. They were required to do that in accordance with the law. Just like in accordance with what God demands for the Christian, baptism is required. But you can be saved and not baptized. You're disobedient, but you can be actually saved. It is not part of what it means to, to experience the salvation experience. In their mind, circumcision, this sign that they had, made assurance that they were saved or they had a relationship with God. We see that all over the Christian community today. We see this sacramental covenant theology that if a child is born into the world and, and family, a family of parents bring them forward and they are baptized as an infant, that that in a sense solidifies their relationship with God and they will confirm it later at a date and time. That was brought over from the Catholic experience by Protestants who did not want to change that, and it became a part of, of many of the church denominations who are mo most closely like the Catholic Church. Infant baptism, it does not save you. Baptism is a sign. It does not save you. Church attendance, it does not save you. They were counting on a particular act or work as confirming their relationship with God. And Paul is saying it does not confirm anything. It is just a physical sign. This wedding ring that I have is only meaningful if it is backed up with a commitment and a relationship. Just because somebody wears a wedding ring, anybody can put on a wedding ring. This wedding ring is a, sing is a symbol of, of a relationship that I have. But somebody else could put it on and, and assume that it means something. It does not. Without the vows and commitments that go along with it, it is just another ring. Circumcision did not mean anything in the physical sign itself unless there was a circumcision in the heart by the Spirit. And then Paul gives this amazing statement. Amazing statement. In verse 28 he says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. And look at this statement. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. That must have shocked him. He is not a Jew who was one outwardly, but being a genuine child of God happens on the inside. Outward things are just signs. Baptism is just a sign. Circumcision was just a sign, a covenant sign of something that, that unless the validity was on the inside, the sign meant nothing. Paul says you're, you're relying on the fact that you've always called yourself a certain thing. You're relying on the fact that you've learned a lot of things regarding that particular religion. And you're relying on the fact that you had a physical sign done to you. None of those things get you into the kingdom of heaven. The only thing that gets you into the kingdom of heaven is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Walter Martin wrote a, a book called Screwtape Writes Again. C.S. Lewis, Lewis wrote the original book, The Screwtape Letters. And the book that Walter Martin wrote is a counsel from Screwtape to his nephew, Wormwood, who was in training to serve Satan. And his uncle, Screwtape, 
rights to tell Wormwood how to handle the world so that the world will stay lost. The goal was churchianity. He wanted to make an enemy's church, and they called uh, uh, Christ, the, everything was reversed, so they called Christ the enemy. He wanted to make the church of Christ, everything is similar to the real deal, but God's spirit is conspicuously absent. The idea is to arrange, arrange to, make, to make the person devout Methodist, Baptist, Anglican, Presbyterian, or whatever. He must come to accept the church as a type of religious social club where people congregate and, in a word, Wormwood, help him to become more religious before hell's sake, not more Christian. That is what we see Paul dealing with here. People who have become very religious, and in that religious atmosphere, are they are assuming a relationship with God. That relationship only happens in a surrendered life before the cross of Jesus Christ and putting our sins, placing our sins upon Him and allowing His shed blood to cleanse us and His righteousness to be placed upon us. It does not happen through any works, through any activities, any changing of labels that we place upon ourselves. None of that works. All of that plays in, but none of that does the work of salvation. Only relationship with Jesus Christ, dealing with one issue, the issue of sin, which is the one barrier that keeps us separate from God. I'm going to ask you if you would bow your head.